Welcome. We are bringing to you another exclusive edition of In Conversation with Hirushi, brought to you by Daily Mira. And today is the start and a continuation of a very important series. And this is in collaboration with the United Nations Population Fund to mark 16 days of activism against sexual and gender-based violence. Global estimates indicate that approximately one in three women that constitutes 35% have experienced either physical and or sexual intimate partner violence or non-partner sexual violence in their lifetime. Factors linked to COVID-19 pandemic, including forced coexistence, economic stress, lack of basic needs, and fears about the virus has led to an amplification in these cases of domestic violence. And to bring you a refreshing perspective into it and to take this beyond words and into action, we have a spectrum of amazing individuals joining you with us for the series. And today we have with us the Executive Director for Women in Need Shelter for Violence Against Women and Girls, Ms. Savitri Vijay Sekar. Thank you, Savitri, for joining with us. We really appreciate it. And um, if I'm not um, mistaken, by accepting this invitation to mark 16 days of activism, um, you too see the importance of actually fighting this issue pertaining to sexual and gender-based violence. Why do you think it's important that we mark these 16 days of activism? I think it's really important that we discuss it. The biggest opportunity we get annually is uh, discussing this during the 16 days of activism, where there are so many campaigns, so many awareness creation, so many... Uh, programs, interviews, etc. So globally and locally, uh, this is an area that is neglected so much and not discussed, swept under the carpet. So this, this 16 days is specially for this, although we should be talking about it year long, uh, but it is, a, it is a problem that has been there from whatever, from uh, history, but we know that it has been slowly but surely increasing. And we need to discuss this issue, bring it out to the open, uh, discuss it openly, where it is uh, necessary for us to find solutions. We, we, we have a lot of challenges, so we need to openly discuss it. People should be open about it and be comfortable discussing it. This is something that is affecting women's rights. Uh, uh, I would say human rights. So we need to bring it out to the open and discuss it freely and find solutions to it. Definitely. And in, in your capacity, within the scope of work you do, how have you been addressing this issue uh, of sexual and gender-based violence? Let's share a bit about your experience as well. So women in need, as you would know, it's not only shelters. We provide all crisis intervention support services needed for a victim of violence. So we, our clientele is women and girls, 99.9%. Uh, and we give them all support services that they need uh, a victim who has faced uh, gender-based violence. So we provide psychological counseling, legal support, legal advice, legal representation, and a shelter services, emergency shelter services, as support services. So these are all the things that women need when they are subject to some form of violence immediately. So it is, we call it crisis intervention work because they need some immediate uh, response to the violence they have faced. And it is important that we try to keep it under one roof where we don't uh, subject the woman to more trauma, asking them to go from uh, agency to agency. And that is why we try to give all the services we need. And Women in Need has been in existence over 30 years. And we have gradually and slowly expanded. We started with domestic violence only, but uh, today we do all forms of violence against women. And we have uh, six centers around the country. Uh, and we provide all these services in all our centers. We have a few uh, hospital centers. We call them one stop crisis centers. And we have a few counselors in about six police stations who also provide the psychological support uh, counseling when they come to the police. Because police is one of the first entry points that women come to. <clears throat> and it is important that the woman is 
meant to feel comfortable, that it's victim friendly, that it is, uh, they are getting a service. So we provide that service in a few police stations. Apart from the support services, of course, Women in Need has been doing uh, preventive work. <clears throat> uh, a lot of, lot of work for 30 years. So we do awareness campaigns, awareness racing, communities, workshops, programs, street theater, <clears throat> forum theater groups, youth groups, uh, a few researchers lately. Uh, cyber crimes is, a, is a something that is raising its head now. So that's a new area that we have been working on. Uh, a lot of young people from the ages of 15 to about 50 uh, are subject to this. We see that number increasing annually. Uh, so therefore, uh, we need to really focus on support services where nobody is uh, uh, nobody is uh, talking about it and nobody is really uh, uh, nobody is really um, addressing it and we are we have been advocating with the state to take this up as a very serious concern of uh, human rights violations and addressing it as a priority issue uh, still it is not given the prominence that it should be given and that is what we would really like the state to do we have been advocating for a very long time to this to be addressed as a very serious issue and we see a, a yearly increase it's just that the i mean we really need must be touching the tip of the iceberg really but we re really have a, a problem very deep rooted into our society <clears throat> and very remote areas don't really uh, access services and they need to get the message they need to get the information so that is still a very important area that we really have to look into it's very admirable that women in need have created stepping stones to at least uh, attend to some of the um, issues that are occurring locally so that is something that uh, is acknowledged definitely and also we see a lot of literature coming up, a lot of uh, people spoke about uh, domestic violence, gender-based violence, sexual violence coming up into the equation uh, when it comes to um, the pandemic lockdown situation. Um, but um, even before the COVID-19 existed, you know, violence against women and girls is recognized as one of the greatest human rights uh, violations and public health issues globally. Um, in Sri Lanka, uh, the demographic and health surveys suggested that 17, I've uh, highlighted that 17% of uh, ever married women, uh, women again aged 15 to 49 have suffered from domestic violence from their intimate partners within the year. Um, as COVID-19 pandemic continues, this number is likely to grow with multiple impacts on women's well-being, their sexual and reproductive health, their mental health, and this also has a domino effect on the economic performance, even though we don't really tend to see it that way. Um, and this is therefore termed as a dual pandemic due to the increased reporting of uh, violence. So what's your perspective on this? Oh well, yes, we had, uh, we had lots of cases. We have a hotline, a 24 hour hotline, and we did receive a lot of calls on those lines. So because of the pandemic and we had to close our offices and this curfew and lockdown situations, um, since our crisis center offices had to be closed down, uh, we, uh, uh, gave the counselors in those areas also mobile phones, uh, official mobile phones, so that um, people can, victims can call them and uh, tell their problem and we try to find solutions. So we had about, during the first lo lockdown, for the last, for the those two and a half months, we had over 1,800 to 2,000 callers, all island. And uh, we tried to give them the support that we needed. Uh, to give an example, we had a woman in somewhere in Hangurangketa, where we don't have a center, uh, who was uh, subject to domestic violence and she was chased out of the house in the night. And uh, she was, I think, a garment worker. And so she had our phone number and she called our hotline. Uh, there, are, there were limitations that we also could do because we have no... Uh, real, um, we spoke to the police, but they also said they also had to have, you know, vehicles and uh, 
uh, we had to wait till morning to see what can be done but we contacted the police and asked them to try and go and find her and she had run away to a, like a small jungle area and anyway she was rescued found and she was uh, taken to the shelter so but we don't also have many shelters we have only three shelters in the country and we support the government providing uh, a shelter for uh, referrals from the state sector also like the women's ministry and uh, uh, the police and the juries uh, do uh, the courthouses also refer clients to us so we provide that service uh, a service also but it's, it is an area that needs to be expanded and uh, strengthened <clears throat> but the covid uh, brought in new challenges because uh, people couldn't get out and as you said with economic problems if you are beaten up we had to get the money to reload your phone or <clears throat> even have access to phone so we realized that the women actually had to face more challenges because there was a lot of problem of alcoholism and uh, subject to abuse because of alcohol and drugs that increased also and uh, so they, where do they go to how do they access services uh, they have there were a lot of single women uh, who didn't know they had women who got maintenance from their husbands during this period they couldn't access the courthouses so they didn't get any maintenance so they had no money how do you support your family how do you eat so there were lots of challenges women faced during the, that time and they were subject to a lot of uh, domestic violence from what I understand and uh, I think the <clears throat> hospital also confirmed that and the police also say that there were I mean the women couldn't even access the services or talk to any officers because uh, the uh, I mean the country was in a lockdown and curfew so what do you do there? Definitely. And also, if I'm not mistaken, uh, right with the onset of the outbreak, Women in Need itself has received around 37 calls within two days alone for victims of uh, domestic violence uh, and of, or loved ones requiring guidance, referrals and counseling, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and also with, with this, um, you know, trying to address this issue, what are the key challenges within your area of work? And what do you see as an emerging challenge in the future when it comes to tackling this issue and making it progressive effort to really dilute this problem locally? So pandemics always bring in lots of challenges and most challenges are for women. Women are the ones who suffer at the end of the day because they are subject to the violence, because there are frustrations, there are economic problems, there are issues in the house, children now uh, can't go to school. I mean, if you take a uh, lower income family, how there are online classes, how do you get data? How do you get Wi-Fi? How do you have computers? How do you have smartphones? Those are the problems the children have. So they in return want the mothers and fathers to support them. Fathers have lost their jobs or they have half an income. Or, so then how do mothers are always trying to find some food to put on the table. But if you have no money, if you have no avenue of uh, providing food, women get, I mean, in my experience, from what I have seen, they are the, get the brand topic. So they get subject to all kinds of uh, forms of abuse. So that has been uh, cropping up in especially in the rural areas where I mean, we have uh, cases in Anuradhapura, uh, Batiklo and Jaffna. Mm, those officers have told us because of economic problems they have been subject to lots of violence. Uh, so it, it is a women at the end of the day who suffer. So we have to see that in, 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 in these problematic times how do we address it and how do we uh, support these women so the system the mechanisms that normally function like the police the gramanila dadis the health workers they have to be sensitized to this issue of uh, gbv gender-based violence and they need to understand that this is a big problem and it is a mentally emotionally draining problem so if you are subject to long-term abuse you are subject to some kind of mental illness as depression there are all kinds of uh, problems that women encounter and we have i have seen it for the last 30 years uh, at being at win that it has 
it drains out the women of their energy, of their confidence, of their uh, capabilities. So we need to look at this problem as a growing problem. And if we address it now, we can, I think, overcome the problem to a certain extent. If the state and the law enforcement agencies take this up as a violation and, 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 and it's a crime mainly, as a crime, I think we can find some solutions to start with. For instance, if for a woman to walk into a police station and them to be victim friendly and understand their problem without saying, it doesn't matter, you know, these things happen in a family, you get beaten up a few times in your life, that's okay, that's common. That is not the answer you need to hear. So you need to make this issue. We have been working with the police for a long time. It is a little better now, but it has a long way to go. And we can. We just have to uh, hope that uh, they will create legal infrastructure and at least take a step forward. Um, with your experience, uh, what has been? It's a big gray area to address on, but what has been the most effective uh, intervention process when it comes to preventing or responding to issues associated with uh, sexual and gender-based violence? I think all the support services, uh, it's important. It's, you can't just disregard the support services because when you're in that position, I mean, you need that support to strengthen you. I mean, we get professional women who can be independent, who are empowered, but who are broken into pieces because of domestic violence. So that support that an organization gives, I think is a key ingredient in strengthening and empowering that woman to stand up again in society and take on life. Because the counseling, the strengthening, no woman comes to, has come to women in need the first time she's beaten. Nobody. It's always at least four or five years of abuse. So for her to make up her mind and come to seek support, is a big step for a woman because there's a lot of stigma. There is a lot of um, justification about the beatings that go on in society. Uh, there is a lot of cover up. So it is a big step for a woman to come because she's ashamed of herself because she's beaten. She's ashamed of the, of the families getting to know the friends, getting to know the children being subject to this. She's ashamed. So she needs somebody to say no it's not your fault it's it's okay you can talk about it let's get out of it let's strengthen you let's empower you so that is important i think the counseling the psychological support is very important and so is the legal support because that is the only way we can say okay if you beat her up we are going to go to court and get a protection order you have no right to abuse so that is important so legal uh, support is important. The shelter is important because if you are beaten up and you have no place to go, the extended family, unlike 30, 40 years ago, uh, extended families also don't want to take this responsibility because they abuse them, they threaten them, they want to kill them. So parents, siblings, they are scared. So we need shelters. We need uh, counselors. We, we need that support service on that. That is the main ingredient. But we also need to do the preventive work to bring up the issue of uh, SGBV, bring it out to the open, talk, to, talk about it, bring it to the community, bring it to society. Why are we hiding it? Why are we sweeping it? It's not a, it, it is a big social stigma. If you are subject to domestic violence, but what about the other side? What about the crime, the abuse that the perpetrator is doing? He just, he's okay. So these this gender myths, the gender disparities that are prevalent in society today, uh, we need to address that. Because it's always the woman. She's ashamed. She's the one who's stigmatized. It's always her fault. Definitely. I think with the legal infrastructure, with education, uh, encouraging to learn more about it, it's also important that women have immunity emotionally to feel comfortable and come forward without having to feel like it's a step back. Uh, in your 
perspective of what is the responsibility of the individual and the community at large in preventing and responding to sexual and gender-based violence, which is the final question of the interview. And hopefully this uh, answer can take it beyond the words and into action. Uh, so what's your take on that? We all can play a role in this, this taking this forward. So communities need to understand that this is wrong. We need to uh, we need to win over this situation. We need to strengthen the woman. We, we have 52% of women in this country. And our issues, are they important? We, look, we, we have to look at it. Are they, are they uh, important to discuss? Are they being discussed in, in the right places? Are policymakers looking at these women who are bringing in a big income to the country? Are their problems addressed? I mean, never mind domestic violence. What about the sexual harassment that goes on in workplaces, in factories, in, in all over? So we need to communities, society to, work, to accept and understand that this is an issue that is going to affect the country at the end. Because the, if you are happy, if you are strong, if you are empowered, if you are positive, it, it brings positiveness to your work, it brings positiveness to your attitudes, and you can be more productive. But if you have a, if you have a society that is drained, that is abused, that is negative, that is not empowered, that is mourning, why, where does it take you? Nowhere. So communities, we all can make a change if we think that we can take, take a step forward. We are all will be responsible to be responsible for the people you love. You start with the people you love, your wife, your daughter, your sister, your mother. You won't want your mother or sister be, to be abused. No. So what is somebody else's daughter and sister being abused, how does that make a right? Think about it like that. And, and so the, 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 the acceptance by society uh, that it's okay, you know, you can hit your wife, uh, you can abuse them, that, that, that is accepted. You can't have that attitude if you want to stop this. It's okay using your power to sexually harass somebody working below you. That doesn't sound right. It's wrong. But you have, all of us have to take that step forward and be responsible, uh, be responsible citizens. We have to have campaigns. We have to make people understand these, all these gender disparities. Don't you think they all are gender bias? If you think back, if you ask your grandmother, you are a much younger person than I am. If you ask your grandmother or even your mother might be able to tell you, that all the myths that we have are gender bias, all are against women. 50 years ago, they said a woman's uh, brain is like a spoon, like you will cut your hand. What does it even mean? <laughs> you know, if all if you look at all the old tales, old grandmother's tales, they're all gender bias. They're all against women. Why? So we need to change that. That is our biggest challenge, to change attitudes of people, of male dominancy in this society. That has to be addressed. Unless you address that, you can't. I mean, professional women, what a battle they have to go up. Why? Because there are, there's discrimination. I was in the police commission to get some of those women to come up to a level where they are capable, they are strong, they are empowered, they are confident, they can do a good job of work, they are qualified, but they won't get that place because there's discrimination. And why is there discrimination? Because <laughs> they don't want to give that place to a woman or for no reason. I mean, if there's a valid reason, yes. So, so the, the, the societal attitudes are the biggest challenge is to, to change our attitudes and we need to take 
carry out campaigns, talk shows, uh, policymakers, advocacy, lobbying with policymakers to change this. And for them to take up this issue forward and say, look, we are all equal. Men and women can all do the same job perfectly well. And we don't need to abuse or better another woman just to keep her down, just to keep her morals down. But we need to treat them as equal and respect them. You respect your mother and you respect your wife. If you have respect for each other, I think we can take the message forward. Definitely. Uh, thank you, Ms. Savitri, for your time and for sharing this insightful information uh, about SGBV. And we wish you all the very best with all the endeavors of uh, Women in Need. And also we hope that these 16 days of activism can definitely go further and uh, more than higher, just to make it more sustainable. And hopefully the community can also uh, learn something out of it and implement it accordingly. So thank you so much for joining with us today. Thanks. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, we hope uh, our lockdown is cleared and we can get back to work and address these issues that women are facing. And uh, all the best to the Vision Network. Thank you for uh, working on this issue. We really appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you for joining us. Bye. Bye. And with that, we are wrapping up today's In Conversation series, but do stay tuned as we mark 16 days of activism against sexual uh, and gender-based violence with many more episodes coming your way. Stay tuned.